Scott Colley, the president of Barry, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first in the English department uh, speaker series. We will have other programs during the year, and you will be uh, alerted to them. My specific job is a double pleasure to welcome an old friend and former colleague, uh, Mark Jarman, to our campus. Mark is the author of seven books of poetry, including The Black Riviera, winner of the 1991 Poets Prize, and Questions for Ecclesiastes, winner of the 1998 Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize. Mr. Jarman has written a collection of critical essays, and his book of criticism, called The Secret of Poetry, will soon appear. He has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. And a footnote, winning a Guggenheim is sort of like making the Olympic team. And the awards he has received for his recent writings are rather like being selected for an, uh, as an all-star. I make these comparisons not to embarrass our guest, but let you, to let you know why I mention uh, these awards and honors. He's written very well for a long time, since he first published a collection of poetry in 1978. Mark Jarman is also a teacher and serves as professor of English at Vanderbilt University. Fifteen years ago, Mark and I were colleagues in that department, and he was kind enough to help me with my introduction to poetry class. After much of a semester of reading widely in a variety of poetical types and forms, my class read Mark's collection of poems entitled Far and Away. All of the students had to write an essay on the collection as if they were doing a lead review for the New York Times book review. Mark, I even made them read the New York Times. Mark then read the resulting essays and spent a class hour with us responding to questions about his work. It was good for my students to read an entire collection by one poet rather than spend all of their time in an anthology. And then meeting and hearing from the poet himself was an added treat. That was a, a mag he's been reminding me of other things uh, from our days together when I would tell him to stop writing and come to class, or no, come in and uh, advise students. But this is a, the fondest memory I have of that period. It was, it was a wonderful experience. Now the theme of the course was poems from other poetry. The degree to which poetry is written in response to the poetic tradition. In Mark Jarman's two recent volumes, we encounter references to John Donne, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Dylan Thomas, Ezra Pound, and John Keats. And without identifying them, Mark also echoes striking images from T.S. Eliot and the Jacobean playwright John Webster. And I was talking to a colleague tonight, and we, we do hear, both of us, we hear uh, Tennyson in these poems as well, the skeptical questioning uh, Tennyson in these poems as well. It goes, it works around, Eliot read a lot of Tennyson, it just keeps going around. The 17th century poet John Donne long served as an Anglican priest. The late 19th century Hopkins was a priest in the Jesuit order. A number of Donne's poems were collected as holy sonnets. A group of Hopkins poems were known as terrible sonnets, as in terrifying. And here we have Jarman's unholy sonnets, as unholy as Dunn's and Hopkins, and as terrifying, in some cases, as these earlier poems sometimes were. Terrifying in that the verse leads us to encounter the presence, the spirit, and even the face of God from our human perspective of flesh and weakness and not knowing. The memories of teenage years of surfing in Santa Monica, or actually at Redondo Beach, uh, bring a middle-aged encounter with mortality and death, remembering back and somehow using that memory to encounter uh, the possibility of bleakness and nothingness. A remembered stories told by one's father force a startling awareness of the void that lies beyond us. Even family picture taking, a Kodak moment outside the Welsh home of Dylan Thomas, brings the following reflection. I thought I caught it all, a floating spark of memory that film would surely fix, only to learn that cog slipped roll was dark and 
Lang is leafy and the river sticks. The river of forgetfulness, the river that is that passage to, uh, to hell, or to Hades, actually. Perhaps it takes an Anglican divine, a Jesuit, a son of a disciples of Christ minister, to see such things, to feel such things, and do notice the rhyme. Many of these points are sonnets, which fall into a variety of sonnet categories which you once studied, but have since forgotten. Don't worry, listen, and you will hear the structure. John Keats, to, John Keats described the sonnet form as rather like a poem bound in chains, and yet he concluded, let us inspect the lyre and weigh the stress of every chord and see what may be gained by ear industrious and, inten and attention meet. So let's weigh the stress and be attentive to the form as Mark Jarman takes us from where we are to confront the blank page that needs our words to fill it. Marcus, come ahead. Well, thank you very much for having me at, at Barry College and giving me an opportunity to fill one of my fantasies Son and grandson of ministers. I always enjoy being in a pulpit. Um, and in fact, realized only recently as an adult that the major influence on me was, uh, as a writer was that I grew up in a house where someone every week wrote something, got up in front of a bunch of people and read it to them. Um, I never realized the importance of my father's influence on me until I was sort of, let's say, his age as he was then. Um, and it dawned on me in a flash. I had always thought, because I had a grandmother who was a writer who was from Mississippi and part of the storytelling tradition of the South, that she had been my influence. But in fact, it was the, it was the example of uh, this man who got up and had to make something out of language that described things ineffable and transcendent as well as he could every week to a, uh, a group of of people, which she called a community of sinners. I won't speak to you like that. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a, a couple of poems, however, um, from my book, Questions for Ecclesiastes, where I begin a sequence called Unholy Sonnets, and then I'll read mainly from my new book, Unholy Sonnets. And I, I think I'll begin with the, uh, uh, a poem that Scott alluded to uh, first. But before I read that, I want to read the epigraph from this book, which is quite delights me. My, this book is dedicated to my daughters. And uh, I found this epigraph in a, in a biography of Thomas Hardy. Apparently, he would attend church when he knew that this would be the scripture. And it's from 1 Kings chapter 19, 12. It's the moment when Elijah goes up on the mountaintop and expects to have an experience of an experience of God, like something out of Steven Spielberg. This is what happens instead. And after the earthquake, the fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And the first poem I'll read to you is called Groundswell. A groundswell where I grew up surfing in Santa Monica Bay was a big set of waves. That's what it meant. That was the local meaning of this term, which in fact means um, either um, uh, in oceanographic terms, um, heavy surf, which is a sign of a storm at sea, or as we use it today, any sort of great gathering. Uh, we would think of almost like ground, grassroots uh, opinion or support, groundswell. This begins with an allusion to a song from uh, Sound of Music. See if you get it. Rogers and Hammerstein. Is nothing real but when I was 15, going on 16, like a corny song? I see myself so clearly then and painfully, knees bleeding through my usher's uniform, behind the candy counter in the theater, after a morning surfing, paddling frantically to top the brisk outsiders coming to wreck me, trundle me clumsily along the beach floor's gravel and sand, 
my knees aching with salt. Is that all that I have to write about? You write about the life that's vividest, and if that is your own, that is your subject. And if the years before and after 16 are colorless as salt and taste like sand, return to those remembered chilly mornings, the light spreading like a great skin on the water, and the blue water scalloped with wind ridges, and what was it exactly, that slow waiting, when to invigorate yourself, you peed inside your bathing suit and felt the warmth crawl all around your hips and thighs, and the first set rolled in, and the water level rose in expectancy, and the sun struck the water surface like a brassy palm, flat and gong-like, and the wave face formed. Yes. But that was a summer so removed in time, so specially peculiar to my life, why would I want to write about it again? There was a day or two when, paddling out, an older boy who had just graduated and grown a great blonde mustache like a walrus skimmed past me like a smooth machine on the water and said my name. I was so much younger to be identified by one like him, the easy deference of a kind of God who also went to church where I did made me reconsider my worth. I had been noticed. He soon was a small figure crossing waves, the shawling crest surrounding him with spray, whiter than gulf feathers. He had said my name without scorn just with a bit of surprise to notice me among those trying the big waves of the morning break. His name is carved now on the black wall in Washington, the frozen wave that grievers cross to find a name or names. I knew him as I say I knew him then, which wasn't very well. My father preached his funeral. He came home in a bag that may have mixed in pieces of his squad. Yes, I can write about a lot of things besides the summer that I turned 16, but that's my groundswell. I must start where things began to happen, and I knew it. Since I mentioned them, I'm gonna read a couple of poems about my, my daughters. I usually like to read these if they're in the audience, because I never miss an opportunity to embarrass them. But um, since a lot of you are their age, uh, you can imagine yourself in their place. This is one uh, about when they were very small. And you imagine a Sunday morning, my wife has gone off, my wife is a singer, has gone off to sing in a church choir somewhere, and I have to dress my children, my little girls, for church. And I don't have a lot of experience at this point of dressing little girls. This is called Dressing My Daughters. One girl, a full head taller than the other, into their Sunday dresses. First, the slip, hardly a piece of fabric, softly stitched and printed with a bud. I'm not their mother. And tangle, then untangle the whole cloth. On backwards, have to grab it round their necks. But they know how to pull arms in, a reflex of being dressed, and also a child's faith. The mass of stuff that makes the Sunday frocks collapses in my hands and finds its shape only because they understand the drape of it, these skinny keys to intricate locks. The buttons are a problem for a surgeon. How would she connect these bony valves and stubborn eyelets? The filmy dress revolves in my blind fingers. The slots work one by one. And when they're put together, not like puppets or those dull saints that bring tears to true believers, but living children, somebody's real daughters, they do become more real. They say, stop it, and give it back, and I don't want to. They'll kiss a doll's hard features, whispering, I'm sorry. 
I know just why my mother used to worry. Your clothes don't keep you close. It's nakedness. Clad in my boots and holster, I would roam with my six-gun buddies. We dealt fake death to one another, fell and rolled in filth and rose, grimy with wounds, and headed home. But Sunday, what was that tired explanation given for wearing clothes that scratched and shone and weighed like a slow hour? That we should shine in gratitude. So I give that explanation, undressing them and wait for the result. After a day like Sunday, such a long one, when they lie down half dead to be undone, they won't help me. They cry, it's not my fault. You find out there's, there, there are things your parents won't tell you about. There's just certain things they won't tell you. They keep it a secret. So you'll find out when you're their age. And, and one of the things about parenthood you find out is that you become nostalgic for your children when they were little. Once, you're, once children become teenagers, you, you discover that you wish they were two and three again. Um, Philip Levine, a poet I greatly admire, has a, a line about this in which he says, all the children went away and sent back tall, ugly strangers. <laughs> well, this is also one of the things I, I found out as a, as a parent uh, that my parents didn't tell me, that you can find comfort and consolation in where your children spend a lot of their time. This is called after disappointment. To lie in your child's bed when she is gone is calming as anything I know. To fall asleep, her books arranged above your head, is to admit that you have never been so tired, so enchanted by the spell of your grown body. To feel small instead of blocking out the light, to feel alone, not knowing what you should or shouldn't feel, is to find out no matter what you've said about the cramped escapes and obstacles you plan and face and have to call the world, that there remain these places, occupied by children, yours if lucky, like the girl who finds you here and lies down by your side. Um, as I said, my, my father was a is a clergyman, and in the evenings when I was growing up, after dinner, he would go and make his pastoral calls. He would uh, call on people in the congregation. And when I was old enough, when I became a teenager, um, he would sometimes invite me to go with him. And usually he would preface these invitations with, come along and learn something. And one of the things I learned, which I hold with me today, was that he saw much more of the extremity of life than I've ever seen uh, as an academic. He saw much more of what it's like for people to suffer greatly uh, than I have ever seen. Uh, this poem is about an evening when he was called out by, by people who knew that someone, he, someone needed his counsel, needed his, his presence. What you will hear in this poem are, are two kinds of language. Uh, you will hear the language of the King James Version uh, of the Book of Ecclesiastes. And then you will hear contemporary English narrating what I think happened on this particular night. One of the things I've always felt obliged to do, being from Southern California, uh, especially being away from Southern California, living in this part of the world, is to represent it as a place where real lives go on. You know, authentic lives, not just cool people, slim guys, you know, long cars, uh, people on rollerblades. It was a, life, a place where urgent life goes on, certainly the kind of life he saw in his church. This is called Questions for Ecclesiastes. I started writing it because I was reading the book of Ecclesiastes, and I came to a passage where Solomon, the purported author, says, 
It is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. And I thought, why is that better? And I began sort of wondering what I could do with uh, Solomon's stoical, even bleak take on experience if I narrated the events of this night opposite what he would say about it. This is called Questions for Ecclesiastes. What if, on a foggy night in a beach town, the night when the Pacific leans close like the face of a wet cliff, a preacher were called to the house of a suicide, a house of strangers, where a child had discharged a rifle through the roof of her mouth and the top of her skull? What if he went to the house where the parents, stunned into plaster statues, sat behind their coffee table? And what if he assured them that the sun would rise and go down, the wind blow south and turn north, whirling constantly, rivers, even the concrete flume of the great Los Angeles run into the sea, and 14-year-old girls would manage to spirit themselves out of life, nothing was new under the sun. What if he said the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing? Would he want to view the bedroom, vandalized by self-murder, or hear the quiet before the tremendous shout of the gun, or the people inside the shout shouting or screaming, crying and pounding to get into the room, kicking through the hollow corridor and making a new sound and becoming a new silence, the silence he entered with his comfort. What if as comfort he said to the survivors, I praise the dead which are dead already more than the living, and better is he than both dead and living who is not yet alive? What if he folded his hands together and ate his own flesh in prayer? For he did pray with them. He asked them, the mother and father, if they wished to pray to do so in any way they felt comfortable, and the father knelt at the coffee table and the mother turned to squeeze her eyes into a corner of the couch, and they prayed by first listening to his prayer, then clawing at his measured cadences with tears, the man cried, and curses, the woman swore. What if then the preacher said, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God, for God is in heaven. What if the parents collected themselves then and asked him to follow them to their daughter's room and stood at the shattered door, the darkness of the room beyond, and the father reached in to put his hand on the light switch and asked if the comforter, the preacher they were meeting for the first time in their lives, would like to see the aftermath, and instead of recoiling and apologizing, he said that the dead know nothing, not anything, for the memory of them is forgotten. And while standing in the hallway, he noticed the shag carpet underfoot, like the fur of a cartoon animal, the sort that requires combing with a plastic rake leading into the bedroom, where it would have to be taken up, skinned off the concrete slab of the floor, and still he said, for their love and hatred and envy are now perished, neither have the dead any more portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. What if as an act of mercy so acute, it pierced the preacher's skull and traveled the length of his spine, the man did not make him regard the memory of his daughter as it must have filled her room, but guided the wise man, the comforter, to the front door with his wife with her arms crossed before her in that gesture we used to show a stranger to the door, acting out a right of closure, compelled to be social, as we try to extricate ourselves by breaking off the extensions of our bodies as raccoons gnaw their legs from traps, turning aside our gaze, letting only the numb tissue of valedictory speech ease us apart. And the preacher said, live joyfully all the days of the life of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life. They all seem worse than heartless, don't they? These stark and irrelevant platitudes, albeit stoical and final, oracular, stony, and comfortless. But they were at the center of that night, even if they were unspoken. 
And what if one, with only a casual connection to the tragedy, remembers a man younger than I am today, going out after dinner and returning, then sitting in the living room, drinking a cup of tea, slowly finding the strength to say he had visited these grieving strangers and spent some time with them. Still that night exists for people I do not know in ways I do not know, though I have tried to imagine them. I remember my father going out and my father coming back. The fog, like the underskin of a broken wave, made a low ceiling that the streetlights pierced and illuminated. And God, who shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil, who could have shared what he knew with people who needed urgently to hear it, God kept a secret. I began in this book a sequence of poems based in part on the, the holy sonnets of John Donne. I wanted to write a poem, I wanted to write a devotional or religious poem, but I didn't think that I could assume what John Donne could assume about his readers. So I thought I would try to write it, as it were, in a, against the grain, in a heterodox sort of way, rather than an orthodox way. And yet, if you look back at some of John Donne's holy signs, they apply a lot of pressure to orthodox belief, and even the orthodox form of the sonnet. So I wrote a series of these uh, for this book, 20 of them, which I called Unholy Sonnets, and they led to the book that followed this book, which is called Unholy Sonnets. And I'm going to read you uh, a few of the original ones that I wrote. And the first one is an audience participation poem. If you remember that here is the church, and here is the steeple. Remember this? Open the door and see all the people. You can do that along with me as I do this poem. Well, after I had written this poem and, and, and actually published it and was reading it for the first time, I was suddenly struck by a moment in the poem that reminded me that on Sunday when I was growing up, my sisters and I would sit in the congregation and count the house. And the number of people present on a given Sunday affected our father's mood for the rest of the, the, rest of the week. And you'll see that there's a moment in here that's kind of startling when you realize how many people are present. So, okay, here we go. Do this with me. Hands folded to construct a church and steeple, a roof of knuckles, outer walls of skin, the thumbs as doors, the fingers bent within to be revealed, wriggling as all the people, all eight of them, enmeshed, caught by surprise, turned upward blushing in the sudden light, the nails like welders' masks, the fit so tight among them you can hear their half-choked cries to be released, to be pried from this mess. They're soldered into somehow, they don't know. But stuck now, they're willing to confess if that will ease your grip and let them go. Confess the terror they cannot withstand is being locked inside another hand. Another thing that I wanted to do with these poems is to see if I could start from an ultimate point of negation and, and proceed from there to a point of, as it were, affirmation. So in this poem, there are a couple of allusions. Um, one is to what I call Dante's rings. If you know at the end of the Paradiso, Dante receives a vision of God. He sees at the center of the great rose of heaven three rings breathing one another. This is, this is what God is, this Euclidean vision of, of the Trinity in which there are three rings of equal size and value, one breathing the other. So that's what I refer to here. Amazing to believe that nothingness surrounds us with delight and lets us be. And that the meekness of non-entity Despite the friction of the world of sense, despite the leveling of violence, is all that matters. All the energy we force into the matchhead and the city explodes inside a loving emptiness. 
not Dante's rings, not the Zen Zero's mouth, out of which comes and into which light goes. This God recedes from every metaphor, turns the hardest data into untruth, and fills all blanks with blankness. This love shows itself in absence, which the stars adore. One of my favorite philosophers, at least of the 20th century, and I think one of the great Christian philosophers of the 20th century, was not, strictly speaking, a Christian, but the French-Jewish philosopher Simon Weil, or Simon Weil, you may know her as. And, and, and um, in this poem, I'm quoting a couple of things that she has said. Two forces rule the universe of breath. And one is gravity, and one is light. And does their jurisdiction include death? Does nothingness exist in its own right? It's hard to say, lying awake at night, full of an inner weight, a glaring dread, and feeling that Simone Bay must be right. Two forces rule the universe, she said, and they are light and gravity. And dead, she knows, as you and I do not, if death is also ruled, or if it rules instead, and if it matters after your last breath. But she said truth was on the side of death, and thought God's grace filled emptiness like breath. This form, the sonnet, 14 lines, it's just long enough to tell a joke in. And um, this is a joke that's popular where I live in Nashville, Tennessee. You may know it. There was a pious man, upright as Job. In fact, more pious, more upright, who prayed the way most people thoughtlessly enjoy their stream of consciousness. He concentrated on glorifying God as some men let their minds create and fondle curving shadows. And as he gained in bumper crops and cattle, he greeted each success with grave amens. So he was shocked, returning from the bank, to see a flood bearing his farm away, his cows, his kids, his wife, and all his stuff. Swept off his feet, he cried out, why? and sank, and God grumped from his rain cloud. I can't say. Just something about you pisses me off. <laughs> um, the little sequence of unholy sonnets and questions for Ecclesiastes, 20 of them, they're in kind of a random order. Uh, though they're numbered 1 through 20, they're really not a sequence, but meant to stand free apart from one another. But the poems and unholy sonnets are in four sections, each of which deals with an issue of interest to me. The first one deals with prayer. The middle two deal with ideas of the incarnation. The last deals with judgment and grace. So this has more of an order and a pattern. And each of the sections has a, a sequence in it of either four or five sonnets. So I'd like to read a, a few of these, starting with the prologue uh, to the book. The prologue, the prologue uh, includes homages, in a way, to, to two poems I love. Um, one is, uh, I will admit it, is Francis Thompson's The Hound of Heaven. He sought me down the alleys of the ears. He sought me through the corridors of my own mind. Long, long poem about this dog, the hound of heaven, chasing this bewildered soul and finally confronting him. And the other is George Herbert's The Caller, where George Herbert is complaining about his, his life as a priest. And he begins by saying, I struck the board and cried, no more, I will abroad. And we get out of this, get, pull off this collar, get rid of this yoke. And at the end of the poem, uh, he hears God speaking to him as if he were a child. 
And the third thing I wanted to do is, in all of these poems, is I wanted to bring in contemporary life and use it for its metaphorical power. So you'll recognize that this, this is, a, like, I think, an example of a contemporary phenomenon lately in the news. Please be the driver bearing down behind him. Or swerve in front and slow down to a crawl. Or leave a space to lure me in, then pull ahead, cutting me off, and blast your horn. Please climb the mountain with me, tailgating and trying to overtake on straightaways. Let nightfall make us both pick up the pace, trading positions with our high beams, glaring. And when we have exhausted sanity and fuel, and smoked our engines, then please stop, lurching onto the shoulder of the road, and get out raging and walk up to me, giving me time to feel my stomach drop and see you face to face and say, my Lord. I'm going to read now one of the, the sequences in this book. This, this is based on a, a passage I encountered in Karl Barth's little essay called Prayer. And prayer, for the most part, is a meditation on the Lord's Prayer. And Karl Barth, as I understand it, was very down to earth. And he said, when we ask God for our daily bread, we should really mean that, mean that bread. But he kind of, at one point, he says this, and I was just struck. He said, prayer exerts an influence upon God's action, even upon his existence. This is what the word answer means. I was struck by that as a kind of, as a prayer, as a kind of way, a catalyst to bring God into being or to connect, uh, to do more than connect, to bring him into being. So this is made up of four sonnets that try to imagine what that's like. And uh, one of them alludes to a story you may know by a writer named W.W. W. Jacobs called The Monkey's Paw. We know the story about the, uh, the couple who come into possession of a little artifact, a monkey's paw, with horrible powers uh, uh, to grant wishes. The word answer. Lightning walks across the shallow seas, stick figures putting feet down hard among the molecules. Meteors dissolve and drop their pieces in a mist of iron, drunk through atomic skin like dreamy wine. The virus that would turn a leaf dark red seizes two others that would keep it green. They spread four fingers like a lizard's hand. Into this random rightness comes the prayer, a change of weather, a small shift of degree that heaves a desert where a forest sweated and asked creation to return an answer. That's all it wants. A prayer just wants an answer and twists time in a knot until it gets it. There's the door. Will anybody get it? That's what he's wondering. The bath's still warm. And by the time he towels off and puts on his pajamas, robe, and slippers and goes down, they'll be gone, won't they? There's the door again, and nobody's here to answer it but him. Perhaps they'll go away. But it's not easy relaxing in the tub, reading the paper, with someone at the front door ringing and pounding, and that sounds like glass, breaking in. At least the bathroom door is securely bolted. Or is that any assurance in this case? He might as well go find out what's the matter. Whoever it is must really want something. We ask for bread, he makes his body bread. We ask for daily life, and every day we get a life, or a facsimile, or else we get a tight place in the crowd, or test results with the prognosis bad. We ask and what is given is the answer, but we can always see it as an answer, distorted as it may be from our God. What should we ask for then? For his return, like the bereaved parents with the monkey's paw, wishing, then wishing again. The last answer when we have asked for all that we can ask for may be the end of time, our mangled child, 
And in the doorway, dead, the risen past. With this prayer, I am making up a God on a gray day prophesying snow. I pray that God be imminent as snow, when it has fallen thickly, a deep God. With this prayer, I am making up a God who answers prayer, responding like the snow to footprints and the wind, to a child in snow, making an angel who will speak for God. God, I am thinking of you now as prayer, as snow, descending like the answer to a prayer. This prayer that you will be made visible, drifting and deepening a dazzling, slow acknowledgement out of the freezing air, as dangerous as it is beautiful. <coughs> um, in writing these poems in a kind of daily fashion over about eight years, uh, contemporary events interceded quite a bit. They came in and uh, I found myself with a way to respond to them. And I don't usually respond well to contemporary events. In my writing usually I have to go back and think of the past and bring it into the present. Uh, so I think you'll recognize the kind of thing that was going on in the what, late 90s uh, that this particular poem tries to apply. He loads his weapons, but the Lord God sees him. He hears the inner voice that tells him yes, the voice that tells him no, and the Lord sees him. Watching as he listens first to one voice, a melody, then the other, like a latch that slips and catches, slips until it clicks. The Lord God sees the hard decision taken, watching with his seven compound eyes as intimate as starlight, as detached. He sees between the victims and the killer each angle of trajectory, unshaken. He sees the horror dreamed and brought to be, and still maintains his vigil and his power, which you and I would squander with a scream. I thought I would, in this particular poem, sort of take the risk and write a number of definition statements about what I thought God was. And this goes back to that idea from Bart that somehow he's an activity that we participate in. God does not know. God is what is known. For affirmation, ask the living bone. God does not love. God is what is love. Ask flesh in which the skeleton is gloved. God does not judge. God is what is judged. Ask rock. Ask mountains that the ice is budged. God is not obeyed. God obeys and lines up when we stop to count our days. God is not life. God is what is lived. And our lives must be seen to be believed. God is not death. God is what survives. On certain days, all creatures love their lives. God is not creation. God creates. Consider things made by our loves and hates. Uh, there's a sequence of poems here, poems about incarnation, uh, about based on my mother's life and her, her present circumstances. And, and one of them is uh, titled with a little Latin phrase, in via est cisterna. One of my daughters was learning Latin and my mother recalled um, that she had studied Latin as a child. But the only phrase she could remember was in via est cisterna. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. In the road is a well. And, and suddenly, that phrase with its resonance for her and her life struck me. In the road is a well. All she remembers from her Latin class 
is a phrase she echoes for her granddaughter. Lately, I hear in everything she says a depth that she covers up with laughter. In the road is a well, but in her mind, it fills with blanks, like a shaft of sand and pebbles. A well is in the road. It is profound, I'm sure. It is a phrase with many levels. And then I see one. The woman with five husbands met Jesus there. But my mother had only one. Unless now, having lost him, she understands that he was never who she thought, but someone who is different men with different women through the years. In the road is a well. It fills with tears. I'm going to read a, a couple more from this uh, uh, one of the sequences and a couple of others. This is uh, one about thinking about just what is the nature of God in our lives today. Nothing but pleasure in the bottle's voice as the cork pulls from its neck. Nothing as the wine finds its legs in the bell of the glass but pleasure on the lips, on the tongue, in the muscles and veins of the throat. And though darkness hovers above the candle flames, there is only pleasure when the face flushes and the lover sees it. Only pleasure somehow in that redness and that witness as the food, some dish prepared for the pure pleasure of it, is consumed. Pleasure, a small god, absent from the vast and crowded morgues of heaven and hell, is our true god. As the lovers disrobe and embrace, and nakedness becomes as delectable as butter and olive oil. Only pleasure watches. Um, the street where I live in Nashville uh, is, a, is a dead end, and at the end of the street are two sort of interesting landmarks. One is um, a sandstone graveyard that dates back to before the Civil War, and the other is the house where the man who wrote the hit songs Honey and Little Green Apples. Johnny Roberts. So this is a little poem about, a sonnet about living on that street. It's called Nashville Moon. I guess it's in lieu of never having written a country western song. Here I am in this town, and I still haven't done it. The moon is such a good thing to come back to. Like the good dream in which a long lost friend returns from death and is once more your friend. And though you have forgotten him, forgives you. Of course, among the stars and before dawn, the reason that the moon seems so alive, but it is truly, deeply not alive, is moonlight and the face that it puts on. The moon sets at the dead end of our street, above a house where someone wrote a song, above graves where some people have been buried over a hundred years right down the street. It shines like it belongs in an old song that might wake people who have long been buried. The last, <clears throat> the last poem I'm going to read from this book is a, a sequence of five linked poems. Um, and what you will hear is that the last line of one section becomes the first line of the next. And the first line of the poem is the last line of the poem. This is based on something John Donne created called the Corona. He wrote a sequence on the life of Christ in seven poems. This is a sequence about everything I think about the world. I thought, I'm going to put it all out. I, I just I call it the world and see if you can say everything. Uh, so um, here goes. Five parts, you'll be able to count them, I think, as you hear what lines The world works for us, and we call it grace. It works against us, and if we are brave, we call it nothing and we keep our faith. And only to 
ourselves, we call it faith. What makes the world work? No one seems to know. The clouds arrange the weather, the sea goes deep, a black stillness seethes at the Earth's core, and somebody invents the telephone. If we are smart, we know where we fit in. If we are lucky, we know what to bid. If we are good, we know a charming fib can do more good than harm, so we tell it. The world was meant to operate like this. The working of the world was ever thus. The working of the world was ever thus. The empty air surrounds us with its love. A fire in the skull ignites the sun. The skin of water opens at a touch. And earth erupts, earth curves away, earth yields. Someone imagines strife and someone peace. Someone inserts the god in the machine and someone picks him out like a poppy seed. In every new construction of desire, the old dissatisfactions rule the eyes. The new moon eats the old and, slice by slice, rebuilds a face of luminous delight in which we see ourselves at last and make sense. It is the mirror in everything that shines. It is the mirror in everything that shines and makes the soul the color of the sky and clarifies and gradually blinds and shows the spider its enormous bride. And we show our reluctant gratitude, searching the paths and runways for a spore of cosmic personality, one clue, even the fossil light of burned out proof. It is enough and not enough to sketch the human mask inside the swarming nest and hold the face a template to the egg and stamp its features on the blank of death. Although we break rock open to find life, we cannot stare the strangeness from the leaf. We cannot stare the strangeness from the leaf. And so we spin all difference on a wheel and blur it into likeness. So we seize the firefly and teach it human need and mine its phosphor for cold light and call across the world as if it were a lawn blinking away at summer dusk. We talk ceaselessly to things that can't respond or won't respond. What are we talking for? We're talking to coax hope and love from zero. We're talking so the brain of the geo will listen like a garden heliotrope and open its quartz flowers. We are talking because speech is a sun, a kind of making. Because speech is a sun, a kind of making, a muteness we have always found estranging, because even our silences are phrasing, and language is the tongue we curl for naming, because we want the earth to be like heaven, and heaven to be everywhere we're headed, because we hope our formulae, like hexes, will stop and speed up time at our behesting, there is no help for us. And that's our glory, a furious refusal to acknowledge Accept in words the smallness of our portion. Pumps heart, lights brain, and conjures up a soul from next to nothing. We know all flesh is grass. And when the world works, we still call it grace. I want to, I want to end with a new, a new poem. Um, since I've already invoked their names, this poem uh, is called Prayer for Our Daughters. And uh, it is written in response to a couple of poems. One is Yates's poem, Prayer for My Daughter, in which he wishes a number of things for her that he never would have wished for himself. He says things like, let her think opinions are cursed. He was a very opinionated man. And the other poem is a poem by Weldon Keys uh, called For My Daughter, in which he basically wishes that he did not have a daughter. But I, what I thought I would try to do is write a poem in which I, I gave my daughters, or wish things for my daughters that I haven't quite been able to wish for myself. Prayer for our daughters. May they never be lonely at parties, or wait for mail from people they haven't written. 
or still in middle age ask God for favors or forbid their children things they were never forbidden. May hatred be like a habit they never developed and can't see the point of, like gambling or heavy drinking. If they forget themselves, may it be a music or the kind of prayer that makes a garden of thinking. May they enter the coming century like swans under a bridge into enchantment and take with them enough of this century to assure their grandchildren it really happened. May they find a place to love without nostalgia for some place else that they can never go back to. And may they find themselves, as we have found them, complete at each stage of their lives, each part they add to. May they be themselves, long after we've stopped watching. May they return from every kind of suffering, except the last, which doesn't bear repeating, and be themselves again, both blessed and blessing.